Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the National Botanic Gardens and the latest in our spring lecture series. Well, I was going to say it's definitely spring today, but it seems to be a bit on hold. Uh, so thanks for joining us this Wednesday afternoon. Now, my name is Mark O'Callaghan. I'm a guide at the gardens and over there is Rory Hodd, Dr. Rory Hodd, who's delivering today's talk on Ireland's oceanic flora, um, moss, uh, tales of mosses, liverworts and ferns. Rory's an ecologist, he's a biologist, and he's one of Ireland's foremost uh, scientists in this, uh, one of our foremost experts now in this area of plants, which a lot of us don't know an awful lot about. He's greatly increased our knowledge and understanding of these plants, their distribution and habitats. He's made several interesting discoveries, including a species of fern new to Europe, deep in the Clarny Woods. He's also the, the author of a new introductory guide to the mosses and liverworts of West Cork, uh, which is published and commissioned by the Ellen Hutchins Festival. All proceeds in the sale of that book go towards the festival. And that's a very important festival. It uh, commemorates Ireland's first female botanist from West Cork, and it promotes plant life and science education. So before we proceed with the lecture today, just a bit of housekeeping. And Melissa has already been talking to you a bit about that there, but the talk will last for about 45 minutes and there will be time for some questions at the end. You can type your questions in the Q&A box um, as opposed to the general chat, because the general chat, we might miss the questions. Of course, in the chat itself, you're most welcome just to chat away. And I see you've been doing that already. We've got people from all over the world, which is great. Um, you can see my co colleague Melissa has the OPW logo and she'll be kind of uh, just looking at the chat and making sure everyone's okay. And so you can, you know, um, questions I suppose will go in the Q&A box, but general chat will go in the chat. If you need to contact us during the lecture itself because your connection is gone or something, you can actually uh, email us at botanicgardens at opw.ie or you can call us at 018040319. The lecture will also be recorded, which was already mentioned, I think, which means, of course, it will be available for all of you to watch as a replay afterwards. Now, finally, we'd like to highlight the fact that today's lecture takes place on World Wildlife Day. Now, this day aims to, World Wildlife Day aims to raise awareness even this year, that is, it's a different theme every year. This year aims to raise awareness of the immense value of forests, forest dwelling wildlife species, their intrinsic link to the uh, livelihoods of indigenous people, local communities who are at the forefront of their sustainable use and conservation, then the economic, social and cultural well-being of communities around the world. Now, why is that relevant to Ireland? Well, we learn about mosses today and very few people in Ireland are, will be dependent on mosses, say, for their livelihoods. However, Ireland is an island that was formerly covered in forest, but which now has the lowest forest cover in Europe at just about 2%. So it's becoming increasingly clear that we need more woodlands in Ireland. We need woodlands back, really not just as a commercial crop, uh, but uh, as uh, in the form of stable and sustainable habitats uh, and for all those lovely species that we're going to be talking about. Woodlands help with climate regulation, soil formation and protection, flood prevention, and of course, as a major habitat for biodiversity, which we've lost a lot of. A healthy woodland is more than just trees. We'll see today that many of the rare and unique species Rory talks about uh, really make their home in the humid and wooded areas, uh, though the habitats are of Atlantic Ocean fringe and play an important role in this habitat. So I'm going to bow now. I'm going to allow Rory to take the floor, and I hope you all enjoy the talk. But we'll uh, try our best to answer any questions afterwards. Rory, could you share your screen, please? Um, hang on. I'm, I'm, typically, it's disappeared. Let's see. Uh, oh, here, no. Uh, one second. Typically, it went fine. Um, five minutes ago when we tried and now, oh, here we go <laughs> there we go sorry there we go okay Great. so you can see that yeah yes absolutely thanks for i'm gonna Brilliant. disappear okay so yeah thanks mark so yes yeah, so today i am yeah um first of all um uh, just to say I, I i've never done an online talk like this before and it's strange not seeing the audience so apologies if if i if i you know get lost at any point or or lose a bit of intensity, but I'll try my best. So yeah, so today I'm going to talk to you about um about well one of the most, in my opinion, any one of the most remarkable and interesting um elements of Ireland's flora, which is its um its mosses, its liverworts, and a few of its ferns. So mostly I'm going to talk about the mosses and liverworts, but a bit about the ferns as well. And talk about you know the origins of these species and some of the remarkable distributions they show between Ireland and other areas. So first things first, I, I imagine that not not everybody watching is a you know is, is a is a botanist, and just to give some background on on what um what what the species are we're looking at. So first of all, um the bryophytes are a are basically a collective term for the mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. So this is just some examples of the um bryophytes on our screen. So on the top left, there's a couple of mosses, um a pleurocarpus moss and an acrocarpus moss. Then there's 
um, a couple of liverworts on the on the right, um, uh, leaf liverworts, thallus liverworts, and then a hornwort on the bottom left. So it's basically the mosses are different to um, um, the higher plants, the vascular plants, that they have no um, vascular system for conducting water around uh, the plant. So they're um, <clears throat> so excuse me, they're uh, not uh, um, the so they have a, you know, they've kind of certain simpler structure in some ways, and 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 much smaller plants and less less de developed in some ways. But they're all, but but they're a very ancient group of plants and are very highly diversified and, and and have their very complex structures, um as well, and and as well as the bryophytes. I'm not going to go into a huge details on 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 the um background of bryophytes as well as bryophytes. I'm going to talk about a couple of fern species, not this particular fern species on screen, but. I will cover some ferns. So these are um, vascular plants. They do have a vascular system, and and grow in similar places to bryophytes in other cases. And bryophytes and ferns are both spore-bearing plants, rather than um, unlike flower flowering plants, and they they reproduce by by spores. And and just say the bryophytes, um, they may be tiny and they're easy to overlook, but they are very beautiful and very diverse groups. This is just a close up of one um, liverwort species, just to give you an example of, of some of their beautiful and unique structures. So, um, first of all, um, just to give some background before I kind of show you some species, why why is Ireland special for these species? And, and why should we care about bryophytes in an Irish context, as it were? So, um, Firstly, if you look at the diversity, so Ireland is very poor in higher plants, so vascular plants, so, so trees, fla flowering plants, and so on. So we have about 10% of the diversity of Ireland's vascular flora, of Europe's vascular flora in Ireland. But on contrast, we have almost half of Europe's bryophyte species in Ireland. So, so, so there's a five-fold difference in, in our you know, relative importance on a European context, and particularly in Ireland, and a high diversity of species, what are known as Atlantic species. So these are species that in Europe have a, um, have a distribution along the very far west, um, close to the Atlantic Ocean, require very um, humid, uh, condi damp conditions. Now, there's no endemic species of um, bryophyte to Ireland. So when I say endemic, what I mean is a species that only occurs here and nowhere else. But there are some species that you know that are found in Ireland but not in Britain or others that aren't found elsewhere in Europe at all. And aside from this um, diversity of, of species, your know, bryophytes grow really well here. So this um, photo in the background is kind of a typical um, bryophyte rich scene. Um, um, and also quite a bit of fern in there as well. So every every piece, every tree, every log, every rock is covered in either a moss liverwort or, or in some cases a filmy fern. So, um, so just before I'm going to be showing a few maps, so and, and so on. So before we kind of get started, just to give a bit of um, what, an idea of what I mean when I say the hyperoceanic um fringe of Northwest Europe. So um, it's kind of an area that because of the Atlantic Ocean um shares a you know this oceanic climate. Um, so Ireland, as you can see in this map, is kind of at the centre of the of of the of the oceanic fringe of Europe, and then you're going north. You have the west of Scotland, Faroe Island, southwest Norway, then parts of um, northwest Spain and Portugal, which not a not a hugely oceanic climate, but somewhat oceanic climate. <coughs> Excuse me. And then um, further south, you have the oceanic islands of Macronesia, the Azores, Madeira, and then the Canary Islands. So these are kind of a more subtropical climate. Um, Whereas we have a temperate climate here, and then as you get to the Faroes in Norway, that's more of a going towards more of a boreal climate. So within um, Northwest Europe, there's you know, a range of of areas of different climatic zones, but they share this highly oceanic climate between them. And then this hyperoceanic, as I say, would just be the far west of Ireland, far west of Scotland, and the Azores, Madeira, and 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 to a certain extent the Faroes in Southwest Norway. So just to just give some background on the climate. So Ireland has, as I said, is a temperate oceanic climate. So temperate zone with this oceanically influenced climate. Um, what does this mean then? So first of all, we have a very small annual range of temperatures. So it never gets too hot, never gets too cold. And you just, you know, in the, uh, anybody who, who's, who lives in Ireland will know that, you know, it's never, 
it's never absolutely freezing, never absolutely roasting, and it can be 15 degrees any time of the year, you know, either July, June, or December, January. Also, very importantly, from a plant's point of view, is this high frequent rainfall. So especially in the far west, it doesn't go many days without raining, and not necessarily a large amount of rain, but just enough rain most days to keep things moist and damp. And then because of the rain, because of the cloudiness coming off the Atlantic, there's very little sunshine. So, so then, you know, this keeps it humid, um, keeps the, the, um, everything moist and, and damp. And then even on a small island like Ireland, there's, there's a very strong gradient of this oceanicity from the east of the country to the west of the country. So in the, you know, if, if you're in Dublin or if you're in, say, Kerry, you know, there's a quite different climate and you see different plants growing different. It's just quite, you know, quite different vegetation and so forth. So what does this climate mean um, for our, our botanical diversity? So first of all, as I said, there's, you know, because of the, the li very little fluctuation in, in temperature, there's very low incidence of frost. So, so, so in, in near the coast in, in the southwest, you know, you may go some winters, you'd, you'd hardly have a single um, day with frost. So, so that means that the species that would otherwise struggle, um, that aren't properly hardy, can survive no problem. Then also in the summer, there's no high temperatures. So, so things that, that, that don't like high temperatures, don't like drying out, also can, can, um, can survive because of these cool summers. And then because of the high year-round year rainfall, first of all, the, the soils are saturated, so peat for, forms quite readily. And also, <clears throat> more, more important for the species I'm talking about is that the air is, 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 is always humid or humid most of the time. So nothing really properly dries out at, at any time, except in, in an occasional drought. And then also, because it's very cloudy, the, the maximum altitude where trees would grow is generally lower than it would be otherwise at this latitude. So this um, this this climate um, really encourages the growth of temperate rainforests. So this is, you know, to, to say the island has rainforests maybe you know at first is counterintuitive because we kind of well there's very little of it left now and what we have is in poor condition. But it is very definitely rainforest, um, and it would have once been much more widespread throughout the country, and now it's just in you know, a few little um, patches here and there. So um, a few um, features of um, rainforests that we, that we have in Ireland that we share with other rainforest areas um, uh, throughout the world. Um, firstly, one important thing is, is the growth of epiphytes. So these are plants that grow on other plants, basically. So this is in, in, um, in Kerry. You can see every little branch is, is dripping with moss. So this is the moss, Isothecia myosoroides, which is a common moss um, on, on trees um, throughout the oceanic parts of Ireland. And, um, in Ireland, generally, your, your most epiphytes fights are either bryophytes or ferns. And, you know, this is similar to a, to a lot of other parts of the world. So, for example, this is um, a photo from one of the nicest bits of um, temperate rainforest I've ever been to in the Paparoa National Park in the westland of South Island of New Zealand. And similarly, every every twig, every branch is dripping with a moss. In this case, um, a moss called the Weymouthia, I think. Um, but again, you know, it's got that same um, growth form to kind of take advantage of the high moisture. And another thing um, that you see in kind of um, rainforest environment is um, is what are known as epiphylls. So these are basically plants that grow on the leaves of, of, of other plants. So um, so this on the left is a epiphyllus liverwort um, in the rainforest, the Western Ghats in Kerala. So there's a little liverwort growing on a dead leaf in the forest floor. And on the right is um, quite a mix of at least two species of moss growing on a dying frond of the Kalani fern, which I'll speak more of later. And actually, apart from the two mosses, is actually interesting in this photo is the, the gametophyte of the Kalani fern, which is something as well I'll talk about later. So, you know, the, because of the humid environment, these species are able to grow and thrive on um on the leaves of other of other plants. So I'm going to kind of take you on a tour of you through a few um, species um, now and and talk about you know the species, the Irish species, and then you know show some maps of where they occur. So so this is kind of the typical habitat for a lot of these um these uh 
bryophyte and fern species in these um lush um ravines really in woodland with um you know lots of nice rocks and and crevices to hide under and lots of hum constant humidity provided by the river coming through so this is kind of uh, yeah i say ideal um oceanic bryophyte habitat so so you know typically in the past you know all all of these ravines would have been um wooded and under a dense canopy but because a lot of um you know most of our woodland has been lost you know in places you know this this habitat is now just just um uh, restricted to a small little pockets um in in ravines where you know in, in otherwise kind of more or less barren upland landscape just where the, where the topography allowed with steep banks and a stream running through a little ravine a little gorge the, uh, these species can still hang on in these in these landscapes so a very important habitat for these species in an otherwise um quite denuded landscape so um just to say a lot of these species you know the best way to find them is to um stick your head in these these little crevices and holes so this is um anybody who's been in the field with me in, in any of these um kind of habitats will this will be a familiar pose to them with you know my legs sticking out of a of a little crevice so that's really how you you if you want to find these species you've got to be willing to kind of root around look under boulders look in in these these really moist little little nooks and crannies so to a to a few species so the first first species i'm going to show you is this lovely little um liverwort which would, would very much grows in these dark caves this is called radula holtii so this is a a little um leafy liverwort you can see those little green um fleshy kind of leaves growing kind of a, on rocks in in dark crevices and these little trumpet shaped structures you can see um are are, are what are called perianths so these are are basically part of the reproductive structure so the developing sporophyte um which is the spore bearing structure will come out of that so that's a very um nice um distinctive little liverwort only grows an island in the far west um mostly in Kerry West Cork and up as far as Mayo then looking at its worldwide distribution this is it so um it was thought in um in northwest Europe until recently that it was one of these species that grew in Ireland but not in Britain but since then in the last decade it's been found in two places in Scotland so it's one one species we don't have as a special one but also um, further south, it grows in um, yeah, Spain, Portugal, and then in the Azores and Madeira. So this is uh, just to explain here what a disjunct distribution is. This shows a kind of a classic disjunct distribution. Most of these species that I'm going to be showing you today have this disjunct distribution. So basically, a disjunct distribution is where a species, you know, grow the same species grows in two separate areas with no kind of connection between the populations. So it's the same species but different. Yeah, but, but, but it's not a continuous population. So here, in this case, there's a disjunction here between the Azores, Northwest Iberia, and then Ireland and Scotland. Another species of similar habitats is this little little um, liverwort here, Lagenia hibernica. So this photo was taken, you know, kind of in a rocky um, crevice beside a stream, looking up at the at the roof of this little cave. So this is just covered in this tiny little liverwort. So and this is really is minute, so you really have to get your eye in to actually see it. But um, again, a similar distribution in Ireland in the in the in the far west, mainly Cork and Kerry. And this just this is its distribution even more um restricted, just Azores, Madeira, and and um Western Ireland. Sorry. And then the next species is another related species. Um. Of liverwort, another Lagenia species is Lagenia flava. So this is um, less restricted to shady, humid places. Grows in in, in temperate um, rainforest. Um, quite common in the right habitat in the southwest of Ireland. Has this lovely kind of opaque yellowish colour, which forms nice big patches that once you have your eye in, is kind of quite easy to spot. And this species now has a wider distribution. So. So this is the first one we're looking at that has a kind of a worldwide distribution. So it's kind of quite remarkable, really, when you look at this, that if you think of um, vascular plant species, higher plant species, you know, none, there's, I don't, as far as I know, there's no species that have a native distribution like this. But this species, you know, it's the same species grows here as grows in, you know, South America, Africa, um, Southeast Asia, and all the way down to New Zealand. So it's a different subspecies now. For the southern hemisphere but still the same species basically so 
so um another thing to say is that um that uh in terms of you know this species has probably originated in the tropics and then spread out from there over time to the temperate areas such as Ireland and New Zealand. And then uh, this is a another um, interesting little um, species that is quite um, rare and oceanic in in Europe. So this is um, called Acrobulbus wilsonii. So this is um, the species. Just see this um, this little green species with these these uh, shoots with the two lobed, pointy little lobes on the on on the leaves. So this is um grows in kind of yeah few few sites in the west of Ireland. Um and it's quite rare and, and quite um elusive often and it's the only representative of its family as far as I know in in um well in Europe excluding Macronesia. So this is its distribution again very restricted. Yeah Azores, Madeira, Ireland, Scotland and the Faroe Islands. So very um small restricted distribution disjunct between Macronesia and here. And even more diminutive is this little um, species here, Cephalosia crassifolia. So at first glance, it looks like just a little green fuzz, really, not much to distinguish it at all. Once you get up close, it's got these lovely um, pincer-like leaves, pointy, deeply lobed. And, and very attractive and has a certain shine to it. And this actually used to be thought to be an endemic to Europe, but um, it was, as it happens often, it was synonymized with the tropical species and now it is known to occur a bit more widely. So this has an interesting, this is a little aside now, but this is an interesting habitat preference because its favorite preference is growing under dense rhododendrons. So as you might know, rhododendron ponticum is a, highly invasive species in Ireland um, and and in Britain as well but this um, species it loves growing in the dense shade provided by rhododendron and actually in more mature rhododendron um, such as this scene here you can see um, you know actually it provides a really nice shady humid habitat for a lot of bryophytes and um, filmy ferns and so on so so I'm not saying anything about oh yeah let's 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 let rhododendron spread everywhere, but just a point that you know rhododendron isn't always a barren wasteland, and for bryophytes and filmy ferns in particular, it's actually once it gets to a certain maturity, it's actually a very rich habitat. And so this is the distribution of of Cephalosia crassifolia. So mostly, um, it's this is this has quite a South American distribution, Central America, Caribbean, and then again Azores. And up as far as Ireland, and it's not in Britain, um, or most of continental Europe. So this is a one that would have come from initially come spread out from the Caribbean and South America at, at some point. And another um, South American Caribbean species is this one, Plagiochila heterophylla. So I don't don't have a great photo of this one, but it's one I had to include. But um, but this is a uh, quite a handsome species grows in kind of t real temperate rainforest species um grows western ireland and and scotland um and actually wales and i think southwest england as well which i don't have there and, and Brittany. but then interestingly this is one of the few of our um bryophyte species that have their main distribution in south america central american caribbean but isn't also in the azores and madeira so so that's quite interesting that it's it's somehow at some point made that leap direct from the Caribbean to to um, Northwest Europe at some point in history. And now just a couple of Thallos liverworts to show you. So this is another fine tropical species. This is quite common, commonly distributed in the um, tropics. This is Dumortiera hirsuta, growing in in Kerry. So where this grows really well, it's really lush, really rich. And it's quite in Southwest Ireland. It can there can be some good populations and it can be quite widespread. So, so it's quite nice um, when I was in India and in the Western Ghats to come across this exact same same species growing, um, looking you know quite similar, maybe a little bit different as, as the same species I knew from, which which was growing five minutes down the road from where I grew up from. So I thought that was remarkable to be, you know, thousands of, of kilometres from home and still see the same species. So that was. That was um, very nice, but it's, it's, it's and um, so this is kind of the habitat in the um, Kerala. So 
So, you know, I was walking through this forest, all these trees, ferns, ground flora that I didn't have a clue of. You know, I, I wouldn't even know where to start putting them into a genus, but I've looked at the bryophytes, you know, in, in a lot of cases, there were a few that, that weren't familiar, but in a lot of cases, I could at least say, okay, that's in this family, that's a Lejuniaceae, that's so on and so forth. But, you know, compared to the, the, the um, vascular plants, I could, you know, I could name a lot of the bryophytes. And another liverwort that I saw there was this, um, one Palavicinia laelii. So this is a species that's actually quite widespread worldwide. But um in I in um in 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 this situation it was growing in the forest, um in kind of a humid pla place in the forest. And as far as I know in North America as well it grows in in woodland particularly and in, in most parts of its range. But in Ireland the species interestingly grows in the well one of the most Unple not unpleasant habitats, but not the most inspiring habitats. This dense um, millennia, the um, purple moor grass in kind of rough places like this, um, in cut over bog and so on. So you just have to kind of part the more the, the the purple moor grass, and then you find the little um, palavicinia growing below it. So I thought it was really interesting that in this case the purple moor grass was providing the the role of a forest canopy and as such. Um, and this is actually quite rare in Ireland, but probably not that it's probably a lot commoner than we think, but it's just that nobody really looks for bryophytes in this um, less than inspiring habitat. And now a couple of mosses of this habitat. Um, this is um, one of my favorites, the um, Cycladictian latoverans, which is the bright green cave moss. I don't usually like English names of bryophytes, but yeah, I think that's a really good apt description. So, you know, you, you find in these deep, caves and, and crevices and it really does shine out this bright green shining kind of moss and it's just beautiful and when I, so whenever i find that you know it's always a real treat and this um once again is distributed um interestingly not in um not in south america but in tropical africa and then macronesia and then up to Ireland and Scotland, southwest England. So in England and Scotland, it's actually a very rare species, and it grows um, in sea caves mainly. So I know in Cornwall that it, it it only grows in sea caves, but in Ireland it grows in kind of in crevices in temperate rainforest um, and in really nice, humid, um, shady places. So um. Uh, Cycladictium belongs to the order of mosses, the Hookeriales. So, so this is a, a ma mainly tropical order, so a whole group of mosses above the family level, and it's you know, it's quite diverse in in the tropics. Lots of fam few families, lots of genera, lots of species. But in Europe, I think I'm right in saying that in Northwest Europe, there's only three species of the Hookeriales. One of them which is Cycladictium, another one which is quite a common moss, which is Hookeria lucens, which grows in lots of kind of wet um shady places and the third one being this little moss daltonius flacnoides so so i'm not sure the number of species in the tropics but there's a a lot you know there's just a few northern outliers of this of this order of mosses that, that reach as far north as scotland really and not much further north so so you know whenever i come across these i always think okay this is kind of more of a link to the tropics than than to most of what grows in in our part of the world. Another um, family that um, is mainly tropical is the Somatophilaceae. So um, we have three species of Somatophilaceae in Northwest Europe. Um, one being Somatophyllum demissum, with these lovely kind of sleek, upcurved shoots with narrow leaves. And what I really love about this family, um, that the English name is the signal mosses, and I think that's very apt because they really shine out um, from the from their surroundings. So they have such a lovely kind of gold and bright colours. So I looked at this slope um, in the woodlands of Killarney, and straight away I could pick out the somatophyllum because of its colour. So it's just there. You can just see how that kind of almost calls to you to to come over and look at it. So it's a really beautiful, bright moss, and just like yeah, it's just almost seems out of place in Ireland in some ways to, with those kind of bright, warm colours. And another re related species also grows in, in Ireland is um, Hageniella micans, which again, well, because I know what it looks like, I'm looking at this, this, this photo thing, oh, wow, that's beautiful, that lovely, warm, vibrant, kind of golden colour. And there's actually not that much of it, just these kind of little patches through here. But, but I think it just, just these, the somatoph somatophilacy, they really do shine out and and have this lovely warmth to them. 
Okay, and I said I'd talk about a couple of ferns, so I will. So um, mostly briar bites, but, but to, to digress to ferns for a few moments. So this is the Killarney fern, Vandenboschia speciosa, as it is now. So um, you may know the story of the Killarney fern, that it was once widespread and common, and certainly in, in southwest Ireland and many parts, because of its, because of its kind of ethereal beauty, it was, it was um, almost collected to extinction, and now it's kind of coming back slowly um and and as again you know in places it's it's it's, it's sort of abundant but it's a really beautiful species um and this is the species um vandenbosch species which is actually endemic to europe and grows mainly in the northwest of europe but it um it's a it's a member of the the um filmy fern family hymenophilaceae which there's i think there's three filmy ferns species in in europe and something like you know six or seven hundred worldwide so we just have a very small sample of them that reach um this far to the um to the north and 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 uh, the um clowny fern is very interesting because it exists as two different stages of its life cycle so that's the sporophyte that i just showed you which is the um spore bearing part of its life cycle which is kind of the what you know as the fern but it also exists as the gametophyte which is this green fuzzy mat that grows in dark crevices so this is actually interesting much more um widespread than the sporophyte and, and occurs you know throughout many parts of europe where the sporophyte doesn't occur and even in ireland it's, it's, it grows in a lot of places where the sporophyte won't occur so this is kind of a sign i guess that it's on its on the edge of its you know of its climatic tolerance as such that it's not you know it can't form a sporophyte but it's it's able to form a gametophyte so there's actually species of fern and other species of Hymenophilaceae that apparently exist only as the gametophyte stage. I think there's one species in North America that's never produced sporophytes, and others, you know, are known mainly as their gametophyte or only as a gametophyte in certain parts of the, the world. So it's interesting. There's two very different um, um, gen uh, growth growth generations, as it were. And then I said there's two other um, Hymenophilaceae species in Ireland. So the two Hymenophilum species. Which are both quite abundant in the west of Ireland. And then um, there's the um, Stenogrammatis myosoroides. So you may have read about this fern, you may have may have heard about it, and I'm not going to dwell on it for too long. So this was basically a very unexpected discovery a couple of years ago. Growing on it's a tiny fern growing on the side of the rock, you know, like un unlike anything I've ever seen before in in Ireland. So after a bit of a bit of um, investigation and and so on and, and 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 getting the specimen checked, it turned out to be this little Stenogrammatis myosoroides. So this is a group of ferns, the grammatid ferns, that are well were thought to be more or less exclusive, almost exclusively tropical, um, with you know a few species that are the current in North America and a cut two species in the Azores, but nothing really, no, no species at all in. Um, the, in Europe, outside of Macronesia, so um, so this is a real um interesting distribution this one has. So basically, it, it occurs in Cuba, Jamaica, and the Dominican Republic, then nowhere in between, Kerry. So, so I'm going to come back to this um later on, but you know what, how did this occur? So, so um yeah, so this is a, a few of the um tropical species. So now I'm going to move on to a different group of species. So I'm going to take you to the Himalayas now. So I, th this is a bit of a gratuitous photo I, I threw in. But anyway, um, this is um, Kanchenjunga from the um, Singalila Ridge on the Nepal-India border. But this is kind of, these ridges are all clothed in this lovely um, rhododendron forest. So this is kind of a humid montane forest, gets lots of mist, lots of cloud, probably well, maybe a bit warmer than Ireland, but not too dissimilar in, in a lot of ways, and, and, is, and is home to a rich bryophyte flora. So um, it's likely that this habitat would have occurred, well, not this site, the habitat similar to this would have occurred in Ireland, um, going back before the forest was cleared, maybe kind of montane forests, not with rhododendron, but with um, birch and, and, and rowan and so on. So So kind of a humid montane forest but of course now this habitat is more or less lost and the species that would grow in that habitat that grow in that habitat in the himalayas grow in this habitat that you can see on screen now in ireland so these kind of north-facing humid um 
mountain quarries at kind of quite high altitude, um, you know, 600-ish meters. This is Mount Brandon, which is one of the most amazing um, bryophyte and botanical sites of the country. Um, so this really rich um, bryophyte flora because of this, this, this really humid climate provided by the shelter of the quarry. So um, in particular, there's a group of species um, of this habitat known as the mixed non hepatic mat. So this is characterized by these large leafy liverwort species um, that form these kind of quite dense cushions on montane slopes. And these are kind of two of the um, commonest, I guess, the most ubiquitous species of this community um, in Ireland. So the, those purple worm like shoots are um, Pleurosia purpurea, and these rusty orange kind of um, untidy shoots are, are Hubertus hachinsiae. So um, Herbertus is endemic to Europe, but it was thought before to um, be synonymous with the species of the Himalayas. And the Pleurosia has this distribution. So its main center is kind of the Himalayas, Eastern Himalayas, Southeast Asia. Um, one outlier, which may be a random occurrence in the Caribbean. And then Northwest Europe, Ireland, Scotland. Uh, pharaohs and Norway. Um, and another nice um, species of this community um, is Mastogophora woodsia. So these lovely spreading shoots. So so um, this is kind of a rare, rarer species that, that only occurs in the best kind of sites. And again, you've got this kind of odd just, oh, and then the last one, sorry, I forgot to mention Alaska and um, British Columbia, but this is a, a similar distribution of kind of Northwest North America, Himalayas, uh, random occurrence, Mexico and and um, Indonesia. And again, this huge gap between its, its its areas of occurrence. So it's a huge distances. And this is one of my favorites. And this is a, a beautiful mix of liverworts here, but the one that the Scopanian embosa is this one in the middle here with these spiky leaves and lovely red color. And um, this is quite a rare species in Ireland, um, only occurring in four or five places. And this um, site was a new site for it that I found in this um, stunning location, um, 700 meters above the sea on the north side of, of Ackle Island and just growing in cushions here. So, you know, it looks like a barren slope from a distance, but you get down into it and this is what you see. So it's a real like micro world as it were. And this species is even more restricted. So, so we've lost the Americas altogether and it's just mainly Himalayas from Nepal as far as um, uh, China um, and Taiwan, and then just Ireland, mainly in Scotland and in Southwest Norwich. So I should say most of these species are at their richest in Scotland. So whereas the more tropical species in Northwest Europe kind of had their their, their mo be best area of occurrence in Southwest Ireland, these um, montane species are, are, are generally occurring, you know, they're more, well, they're more common in Scotland than they are in Ireland. Another lovely species that is very much more common in Scotland is um, Plagiocyla carantonii, these lovely yellow shoots with its leaves all pressed together in a lovely kind of neat fashion. And um, this only occurs in two sites in Ireland, so it's a real rarity, but it's kind of inexplicable because in Scotland it's actually one of the, the most prominent species of this community. So this one is again very restricted, just yeah, Ireland, Scotland, Faroes, then Himalaya, and nowhere in between. It's actually a different subspecies in Ireland, but not a different species. Sorry, Ireland, Scotland, Faroes than in the Himalayas, but not a different species. And then this is kind of an oddity, um, Adelanthus lindenbergiana. So this species was originally described from Ackle Island as Adelanthus dubortensis back in the in the early 1900s, but it's since been synonymized with a tropical species. And it's this lovely um, upright blackish yellowish shoot. Um, growing amongst the hepatic mat. So this species um, has quite a diff it, different distribution. So it's not found in the Himalayas at all. There's some occurrence um, as far north as Mexico, but mainly, the main part of its distribution is, is um, Western South America through to that's South Georgia there, which is interesting. Um, that's Tristan da Cunha, tropical and Southern Africa, and then kind of these African islands off here. 
So it's very much a southern hemisphere species that reaches its northernmost occurrence in, in western Scotland. Um, but in Europe, it's mainly an Irish species. I think it's 11 species, 11 sites in the west of Ireland, and then one site on the Isle of Isla and one on the Isle of Jura in Scotland. But this is a, yeah, quite a remarkable disjunction that it has. And just a couple more nice species of this this community. Um, this is another nice one, Scranion of the Podioides, which is again a Himalayan species, and Bazania pearsonii, another mainly Himalayan species. And a couple of mosses that kind of show that same distribution. Um, this is Dicranodontium uncinatum, this lovely, really hooked leaved moss that, 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 that um, in Ireland is mainly kind of Connemara and Mayo. And then Paraleptodontium recurvifolium, these lovely curved back leaves growing kind of wet rocks and grassland in north facing corries. And then there's one other kind of disjunct oddity, I think. So this, um, this, this species, Dodiamondon maximus, is a very handsome, large, relatively large piece for a moss that, um, that grows quite different habitat to all the other disjunct species. So this one generally grows. Um, well, it only grows in Sligo and Leitrim on these north-facing um, limestone cliffs. So this has a really rich bryophyte flora, but the rest of the species are found in Scotland, northern Europe. But the Diamond Maximus in, U in Europe is only found in this tiny area of, of um, northwest Ireland, where it's quite common in a very small area in the right habitat. And the next place it grows are Mongolia, eastern Russia, think that maybe in Central Asia, it's a bit unclear how common it is in Central Asia, and then yeah, British Columbia and Alaska. So again, a remarkable disjunct distribution. So um, what's actually happening here? So there's kind of two um, explanations, two theories for how these disjunct um, distributions come about. So the first one is that these species were once much more widespread and you know over time they've become more restricted and and, and contracted to two places as conditions have changed that, that are still suitable for them or that these species have managed to disperse over wide distances um from a, a central area of spe uh, where the species would have emerged and then dispersed by spore to other areas so in this case for example from the caribbean to ireland so, I mean, it seems, you know, it sounds very amazing that a, that, that a species could um, travel by spore across the Atlantic Ocean. That's like 7,000 kilometers. But, I mean, it seems actually like the most plausible kind of explanation for um, this. And I think that the idea that this is a relic of a wider distribution doesn't really... Um, doesn't really add up and it doesn't really make sense that that these species would have just persisted in this these areas and somehow managed to occur in these um well obviously in, in, in say with the himalayas and here that they would have been able to occur in these intervening areas um for the thousand um thousand of years ago but then have now been lost so yeah what are the chances of this long distance this long distance dispersal happening so so firstly um, bryophyte spores and the spores of the ferns I was talking about, so the stenogrammitis, are tiny. So uh, these are some moss spores that I got from a moss in my garden a couple of days ago in the background. And these were about uh, 20 microns across. So they're, you know, absolutely tiny. And and there's, there's that each um, spore, if I, each capsule will produce thousands and thousands of spores. So there's a lot of them out there. And also there, you can see they've got quite a tough outer kind of coating and yeah, they can survive a certain amount of abuse so if you look at the prevailing winds in Ireland they come from the southwest and the jet stream basically comes up from the Caribbean you know hitting Ireland so there's a lot of you know very fast air at high altitude being pushed around and for a lot of species it's clear that you know that the you know they would have landed on the Azores or Madeira and then you know maybe re produce spores again and then they could fly onwards from the you know the spores could be dispersed onwards from there to Ireland. So that's kind of acts as a halfway stepping stone between here and and uh say the Caribbean, South America, even though obviously in some cases um the these species don't exist on, on um 
on those islands. So maybe they managed to make it all in one jump. And these species generally would occur in high altitude cloud forests. So they'd be at like maybe 2000 meters altitude already. So perfect for being released into the atmosphere, into the air currents. You know, it's not like they're growing in a lowland forest. They're, uh, they're somewhere where the spores, if they do get into the blown up into the wind, then they can travel. And if you think about it, many of these species must have been here for thousands of years. And also, you know, there's been lots of oppor- so there's been lots of opportunities for them to um, these spores to land. So, so these species, yeah, there may be loads of spores coming, and most and ninety nine point nine 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 percent of them are landing in the wrong place and not germinating. But you know, just one, you know, just 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 the odd spore, you know. You know, there may be high, very high odds, but over thousands of years, those odds really um, do get cut down. And, you know, the f- conditions in the forest and the rest of Ireland is quite similar to that in a cloud forest in the tropics of 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 the Caribbean or Central America. You know, they're not actually that dissimilar. You, if you think about it, there's kind of, you know, very humid, um, not too hot, not too cold. So, yeah, so some differences, but not huge differences. And all it really takes is one spore to land in the right place and get started. And then, you know, that's it. You can, you know, the species can start off from there. So, you know, it's, it sounds fantastical, but it's, you know, it's, it's definitely, definitely seems to be the most likely um, reason for this distribution. So then you say, what about the, um, the species that grow in the Himalayas and Northwestern North America? So these, you know, you know, a lot of the same factors don't 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 exist. So they you know, they're, they're, there's not the southwesterly um, winds. There's no intermediary um, populations. So how do they get here? So that's a little bit of a mystery. And also, most of these species don't actually produce sporophytes in Europe. So they do. I think they generally do in produce spores in in um, the Himalayas, for example, where they may be at their optimal conditions. But in Europe, they mainly just reproduce probably by little fragments of the plants breaking off and then getting moved around. So it seems unlikely the fragment would be able to, very unlikely the fragment of leaf would be able to to get blow over all that distance. So you know, it's there's a lot really we don't know. So you know, lots lots to find out and, and, and lots of secrets that the bryophytes might and the ferns might hold on to. So then the final question is, you know, that that uh to, is, you know, what's gonna turn up next? Because that's I think it's absolutely very exciting that that if there's all these species bl- with their spores blowing around the, in the wind, you know, they who knows what'll turn up next that that we have to be on the lookout for, you know, new fern species, new bryophyte species that may become established or may already be established but just in small populations so i think i'm about on time there so i'm going to finish there and just thank you for for listening oops Sorry, Rory, I seem to have lost you there. Oops, sorry. Hang there on. we are, there we are. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Rory, thank you, that was excellent. Um, so many uh, amazing images and uh, so much excellent information. I know I should know more of these species. Uh, uh, I'll have to do a bit of homework, um, but even t- just to, to see the variety of them, some of these things are like jewels as well. They're incredible things to look at. Mm, um, yeah. We do have a few questions now for you the next few minutes, but um, thanks very much for, I suppose, just even just that's only a small amount of the species you're going to see in Ireland, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I mean, totally, yeah. And they all have their different forms and the different habitats. And it gets me thinking a lot about, about these habitats and about the, the state they're in. Um, mm. the, the, maybe people even start appreciating more the, the, the mosses they have on their lawns. And I think we do have a question in relation to that as well. I just, I suppose I'm struck by the picture, especially that you had of uh, Roger's Engine Forest in the Himalayas. And the next picture then was of mountains in Kerry and the complete almost, well, not a lack of vegetation, of course, because you have the bryophytes and, and, and the ferns growing in these these crevices and so on. But, you know, our bryophytes and so on, with, obviously there's particular climatic conditions in Ireland, it's very wet and humid and so on. But is this group almost a proxy for other groups of plants and animals, invertebrates and so on? Um, you know, I was, for example, in Nova Scotia a little over a year ago before the great what have you that's happening at the moment. And even the the it's quite a different climate there but there was so much more in terms of ground vegetation shrub vegetation um herb layer and um w- w- what would you do uh to like 
what would you see as the most important thing we can do to increase um, just the, the range of some of these um, species, which are then a formation of the habitat? Because again, like the Killarney filmy fern, you say the gametophyte occurs in lots of places, but the sporophyte stage only occurs in a few places. Is that a sign that the, just, as you're saying, the habitat isn't there for them? Yeah, I mean, really, I think it it is. I mean, that, that it is really, it is a case of just getting the habitat back, you know, that we need you know that these species are kind of really restricted so they're just in their little little niche and but if you let the habitat come back you know create more more woodland create more you know at least more less kind of hammered ground less overgraze less you know just just set a bit aside you know to to let things come back and they'll come back by themselves really that you know so these these um species you know these habitats are very resilient really you know you just have to you know give them the space to to to, to to grow and to we, we we can see the resilience i suppose by the fact that they're hanging on in these places and uh, we do have a few a few questions there from the audience uh an interesting one i've got a quite a few votes is it possible to establish some mosses in a dublin suburban garden any suggestions as to how appreciate it well okay yes yeah, so oh definitely yeah i mean i'd say that there probably is already plenty of mosses in in most dublin suburban gardens i think there's a few so i mean if you're yeah i mean what you really need is a nice kind of shady um humid kind of corner of the garden and you know you you could kind of take i suppose really you just need to create create, create the kind of find the the corner of your of your garden you know make sure there's not too much kind of um overshading it as such you know create the conditions and maybe get a couple of common species if they if you can find a few bits kind of somewhere where they you know for example, you know, any any bit of grassland, you know, I suppose you you might find it. I'm trying to. I'm not. I'm not saying take bits of bryophytes from the wild. I'm nope. trying try to be careful here. But I mean, you'd often find like you know bits of cushions that might have you know fallen off a roof or something. Or you can often rescue bits of moss that that, that might be somewhere that's going to be developed for a you know for a housing estate or something. You know, so there's often, you know, even if your garden doesn't have these species, you might be able to find some nearby that are basically just going to get destroyed anyway. So you could try transplanting those, but yeah, don't take them from, from the Learning. wild, but there's no, yeah, there's, there's no need to take them from the wild because they are everywhere. So they are, we hear ads on the radio for getting rid of mosses from your garden, yeah. etc. but it's, it, it's green and it doesn't have to be cut uh, all the time like grasses. So go ahead, grow mosses. Exactly. I um, think most people in Kerry should have, should just let their lawns Turn, leave them be turned to moss because like most people in, in certain parts carry i know from experience of you know they're always struggling against the moss and just let it be you know and you have a much nicer lawn indeed yeah much uh, much it uh, soaks up all the water and everything another question um are any mosses or uh, liverworts present in ireland which could have be considered an invasive or have a tendency to outcompete i think there are a few are there there is there's a couple yeah there's a, there, there's very few but there's one called campylopus intraflexus that um it's it's interesting story because it's a southern hemisphere species and it's first recorded in Europe, I think, in the early 1900s, and and since then it's just spread so quickly that it's now in every country in Europe, and you know in every part of Ireland, every part of Britain, every part of Northwest Europe, you, know, you find the species. So what it really likes is um bare peat. So where you know bog has been cut over and the surface has kind of been left, you'll often just find a mat of this Campylopus, and you know it's there you know, not really letting anything, you know, come back and, and out competing, you know, what might come in. So so that's one. And there's another one that's not as common called Orthodontian lineari that is it's kind of spreading now, but in England, not here, we don't we don't have the other species, but there's another related species that it actually um has out competed. So this is a really rare species, is Orthodontium gracile that so this orthodontic lineari has come into its habitat, taken over, and now the rare native species is more or less gone. So it's a, a sad story. Um, we might look at, well, there's a few more questions to answer. So are you okay, Roy, to hang on a few minutes? Mm, sure, sure, yeah. Grant, yeah. Um, is there anything, uh, could you explain what was mentioned about clouds affecting the altitude that trees grow at? So this isn't a moss question, I suppose, but it was affected. So you mentioned that there's a low tree. I was kind of surprised to hear that myself of the, the different things that affect trees growing. I didn't know clouds were a specific factor. Well, but yeah, it's a mixture. I mean, it's a mixture of cloud and and the um, exposure is a big thing as well. I mean, that the that this is um, 
so 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 well this is going back to my phd now so this is a few years ago when i i studied all this so i'm trying to remember but i think that naturally the tree line in ireland would be about well depending on exposure but the maximum in the west of ireland would be about 600 700 meters so that leaves you know a, a few hundred meters at the top of the of, of the mountains that would naturally be tree free so um so and on the west coast like some places in say donegal for example where you're facing the wind you know it's always windy always a bit you know you know just 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 very um difficult conditions that yeah that uh the, the, the trees would wouldn't grow above about two three hundred meters so so it's kind of so there's kind of a whole lost hab in most places a whole lost zone of habitats there that we've, we've got the odd little scrap of the natural woodland left but you know maybe the odd bit of montane heath you could say is kind of almost natural here and there but most of what we have you know had above you know the upper part of the, the natural tree line towards that what we would would have had there is probably yeah is, is kind of more or less gone in ireland i see is there any dna evidence that suggests the origin of some of these disjunct species in ireland has any work been done on them on bryophytes there has some of the um himalayan species um I should have read up on this beforehand because I, I can't remember now what exactly they found. But yeah, they have done the DNA work, and and I think from what I remember that the um what well this was working mainly on Scottish populations. But from what I remember that that they found that the, that the yeah the Scottish populations are derived from the Himalayan populations. So so basically that they must have at some point you know that come from the Himalayas and 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 established here as a direct. Yeah, result of dispersal from the Himalayas. So, and they probably haven't been here long enough to to, to actually turn, become a new species. So maybe in time they'd they'd speciate and become a new species. But at the moment they're just you know they're still genetically similar to the the other populations. Just looking through the the questions now. Uh... Any good guides to identifying bryophytes from for beginners? Well, there is there your book, Rory. <laughs> oh yes, yes, there's this one. Yes, the, uh, like so that that is a good reason because I suppose as you were saying, a lot of them don't even have English names or mm. common names, and you know it, it's I suppose for some people it would be a daunting field to get into identifying bryophytes uh, as a beginner. So I mm. think that the guide that you recently produced is probably a, a good. It yeah, is, of course, for it's a, go on. Sorry. No, I was just saying that it's it's very much this is kind of, this little guide it's it's really just gives a little kind of foothold as such. So you're not going to sure. identify loads of species, but you hopefully the idea is it'll kind of you know getting to know the difference between a moss and a liverwort and the different types of moss, different types of liverworts and various growth forms. And then once you got that, then 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 you know if you're still not scared off, then you can go to a more serious book. So there's the British Biological Field Guide, which has got most species in it, but um. You know, it might be a, bit, a lot of people say it's quite daunting just starting out. But then, if you've got a little foundation, then you can go to the field guide, and then you know that has really nice pictures and descriptions and so on and keys. So it's kind of just a case of slowly building your knowledge. Of course, that's often the way to do things, isn't it? Um, our a couple of questions on pollution. Are bryophytes as sensitive to pollution as some other organisms, uh, such as lichens? Are they an indicator in that way? Yes. So going back to um, the 1960s 1970s in england in lowland england almost all the um, epiphytic bryophytes growing on trees it was the you know was the bryophytes and the lichens you know most of them just disappeared so so there's a really low diversity there and but then in the last 20 years there's been a huge resurgence because you know there's less pollution the air is cleaner there's been a real resurgence of of the bryophyte species so definitely there's a then, you know, they, they have been used in the past as indicators. And, it's and would it be a big proportionally, would, it be a, would they represent a big presence in terms of oxygen production in the atmosphere? Um, hmm, that's a good question. I've never actually st looked into that one, but I'd say that they they must. I mean, that there's so many of them. And I mean, this, in certain parts of the world, there's such a, a sheer biomass of them as such. Of course, that the, yeah, that the, if they're present in large, uh, if they're a large proportion of the biomass, they're probably going to be a large proportion of the oxygen production. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, I'm sure there must be studies into that. So I just haven't, haven't read up on that myself. What's, well, anything that can be done to help reinstate temperate rainforests in the West and Southwest, what would you say would be the, the most basic and easiest measure to do? 
well, I mean, it's it's a case of just setting aside land, really. It's just fencing you know, it off. Fencing it off, getting us. Problem is, there's so much deer. So, for example, in yeah, in, this, in in Kerry, for example, that you can't just leave it be because yeah, the the deer will eat everything. So, you just gotta you know, find a bit of land, get you know, I suppose, and also having a community buy-in, I think, is important. That you know that it needs to be kind of a yeah. I think we're seeing now that these projects, you, you know, this, this idea you know, rewilding and everything, is you need you you can't just be like there's this perception that you know oh yeah this is kind of coming in and taking our land or whatever but it can't be like that you know, you've got to have it as a community thing that it's Absolutely. everybody's on board that so if you're rewilding this land that everybody sees the benefits because it's not going to work otherwise that you know it's just so i think that before we you know b- b- before we go about fencing it off fencing it off we've got to make sure that you know it's yeah, that, that people know the benefits and understand that why it's so important. Of course, and how it'll continue to be important throughout their lives and throughout the lives of the people who come after them. Mm, exactly. um, somebody asked a question about geology, the range of geology for moss substrates in Ireland. Limestone was mentioned in one case, and how about others? Of course, the geology of Ireland is hugely varied, but anyway. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, mosses and liverworts, they do vary between, yeah, hugely between between geology is a is a big factor. So you get a completely different flora on limestone, as you would on sandstone, for example. So, so yeah, so so geology is very important, and you probably get more diversity on. In general, you get more diversity and more kind of, but interesting species on more siliceous rocks. Okay. But, but except in upland limestone, so like in um, Ben Bulban and places like that which are really, really rich, but that's kind of almost an exception. That are, And there is, you know, an island anyway, that, that there's a lot of species that would be limestone specialists that wouldn't really grow widely. So we, we don't have the altitude here. Yeah, exactly. Basically. And also there's ones like in the south of England, it's like these chalk specialist species, things like that. And we just sure, don't, we don't have, have that soft, that soft rock there, which exactly, will break exactly, down. Yeah. yeah. And soft rocks, what a lot of them like. So even, um, in like on sandstone, so in Kerry, the best place always to go is where there's a little bit, the rocks a little bit different, maybe a little bit of kind of nutrient enrichment, a little bit, um, not nutrient, but like, uh, sorry, calcium enrichment or, or other mineral, mineral enrichment is what I mean, and a little bit soft so that so the, the bryophytes can just get in there and find their perfect little substrate. So, yeah, so it makes a big difference. To, uh, yeah. And is there any just any uh, evidence that the distribution of some biophytes might be explained by movement of continents over millions of years? Maybe some, but I mean, in in other parts of the world. But I mean, here it's it's tricky. I know that there's that is the other kind of hypothesis as such that 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 that, that this is you know these are relics from when the continent was yo. Know, but I, I mean, bryophytes are so mobile because they've got these tiny spores. Yeah. So they're always moving around. So some of the species that are everywhere, you know, they might have, you know, there might be something. But I don't think that most of these distributions, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't explain it. Okay. And do many things eat mosses? Are they subjected to herbivory? Uh, by the odd slug and snail, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But, but not in a major way. I mean, sometimes you see, you know mosses whether whether all the capsules have been nibbled off and stuff but and then you do see yeah, the odd bit of slug herbivory but there's never like massive you know, i don't think well deer might occasionally eat them i don't think anybody anybody's proved that though so and i'm not sure there's any studies that have actually said okay yeah this is definite deer grazing or anything like that and again in your in your garden a slug will go for strawberries before it'll go for mosses exactly so, exactly there's usually yeah. something better to eat yeah um, Someone's asking, is there anything to look out in particular in northeast Mayo, in the area of Bonnie, Conlon, and the, the Ox Mountains in Mayo? Oh, yes, yes, yes. There's some very nice. Um, actually, if I'd had more time, I would have talked about some of the, the amazing flushes there. So, up there, kind of round um, Bellacoric and into the, the foothills of the Ox Mountains, there's these amazing um, iron rich flushes that have loads of lovely, lovely mosses, some of these relict, um, relict kind of fen mosses. So, these are species that. The, the, you know, the, the, are kind of more northern European, continental. They don't grow anywhere else in Ireland. Very few places in Britain, or none. Some of them not at all in Britain. That that just hang on in these few little flushes. So there's some yeah, really nice, nice habitat around there. Would there be an optimal time of year to practice species ID skills with bryophytes in Ireland? I mean, I know some of them would have their 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 sporophytes up at different times and so on. But it would now would actually. Is summer better or is winter better? Because of course there's less uh, other plants, vascular plants growing. 
Mm, yeah, winter is generally considered to be the best time because, well, first of all, yeah, because there's less other things to look at, so that because you know, they're always there, so you can always look at them, and also a lot of them do produce their sporophytes over winter and you know late autumn or early spring. So at the moment now, if you go out, you'll see quite a few moss sporophytes around. So it is a good time at the moment. Uh, and yeah in the summer it's not such a big thing in, in ireland because we have such a nice humid climate but in, in if there's a really warm summer or maybe in a more sunny areas sun, summer's not good because they're all just dried up and shriveled and you can't identify yeah. anything so you know, winter's a good, very good time are there any practical courses in ireland organized courses that people can follow or is it they tend to be kind of fairly infrequent yeah they're pretty infrequent yeah so so i mean i haven't actually run a a bryophyte course now in about five years i think that nobody's kind of asked so and i know um joanne denyer sometimes runs courses but there's few other courses in ireland but i think there's prob possibly is a an appetite for for some bryophyte courses so maybe well, we hopefully the, the more more after today as well yep. a question about the tree fern forests in kerry some of these dixonias oh. uh have you found any hitchhikers on those in the southern yes. hemisphere there is quite a few hitchhikes on those. So that was another thing that if I'd had another half an hour to talk, I would have would have covered. But there's there's actually quite a there's about five or six species of um of moss and liverwort that yeah that that, that are actually quite happy in Southwest Island now that, that that are Southern Hemisphere thing. So so most of them haven't spread from the tree ferns themselves, but a few of them have actually spread onto the surrounding rocks. So they're not invasive, but they're hanging on. So if you go to I think yeah, like I'm um, in um, Doreen Gardens near Lorock. There's a there's there's a couple there, and then on Garanish Island near Sneem, there's there's a few more established there. So I always kind of enjoy looking at these tree ferns. You never know what you'll find. It's kind of an, a little um, excitement, you know, a little lucky dip of briar fights. And how did you get into this yourself, Rory? People are asking. Oh well, um, I kind of got into this. Well, I've always been into plants since I was quite young, but I grew up on the edge of the Killarney National Park, so there's mosses everywhere and you know, but even then i didn't really get into them but then i when i was doing my undergrad i was doing uh my undergrad project in fourth year i was doing a a study of scree slope vegetation in the, in the reeks mountains in kerry and on these screes it was like okay there's a bit of grass there you know maybe some scraggly bit of some other vascular plant but the rest is bryophytes so i kind of had no choice but to just identify the bryophytes and, and i said oh some of these are actually quite cool you know i've got some rare species here so i was kind of you know enthused from there and and then did my phd looking at well montane heath vegetation and some of the well the northern hepatic mat um species that, that i was talking about there and then i just kind of built my knowledge and my interest from there so it was kind of i suppose i was lucky to to grow up somewhere where there's where you can't ignore the bryophytes and work in somewhere oh. you can't ignore them and then just um yeah get you know get the right opportunities now we've kind of covered a bit of this already are there any tree or shrub species that would be that would create ideal conditions for mosses and liverworts in your garden you know are there any particular you could put in there hmm good question um I mean, if you want to have epiphyte species, elder is a very good tree of okay. native species that, that that is really good. You know, if you find an, a nice elder in a shady place, that's often covered in bryophytes. And actually sycamore, even though people don't like sycamore as a non-native, but it's actually quite a good bryophyte substrate. Um, and if in terms of, sh you know, sh if you want, you know, species growing on the ground, I don't think it really matters what tree you have shading it, you know, as any, long as it's, any bit of shade. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And has, has speaking, I suppose, a slightly related matter, uh, has any changes been recorded um, in relation to global warming of bryophyte distributions? And um, would you expect things to, to change in terms of the recording or in terms of the process itself? Well, this there's not been anything kind of not well in 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 Ireland anyway there's not been anything kind of proven but I think well I, I did a bit of work on this as part of my PhD was modeling how species might change the distribution some of the species I was looking at so we yeah, have a climate change and some of the species I was looking at they did um they were the some of the oceanic species so some of the the montane oceanic species so in theory these oceanic species would could um expand you know if the habitat was there they could ex climate change could actually be um, good for them, and some of these sudden, these more tropical species as well, they could expand their habitat. So sorry, expand their range. You know, if the habitat was there, they could expand. So I think the climate change, 
you know it's not negative necessarily for every species some of you know some of these species they could actually but of course it's then the some of the montane species would suffer but some of the yeah the less montane species might might expand and also Kalani fern interestingly i think that that's one that we're seeing evidence little bits of evidence that maybe climate changes is helping it to expand again and, and grow okay. better so so we might get some of those sporophytes after all yeah yeah no the sporophytes might be everywhere in a few years now yeah <laughs> Well, Rory, we've people even asking, are there going to, like, they'd love to take a tour on mosses in Ireland. They're wondering if there are any tours. Um, I, I don't know of any myself. Do you? Maybe you could, no, uh, no. maybe when uh, when the pandemic is over, you could take people on a few biophyte tours. Oh, definitely, uh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, that'd be, that'd be fun. Yeah, I mean, it'd be a nice, nice another string to the bow, another thing to add to the portfolio. <laughs> oh, definitely. Um, I think now, actually, I think there might be one or two more questions there, but I think that's, I think I've covered most of them now. Hmm. Oh, somebody's asking what what bit? Oh, yeah. Some there's two questions. There's, would sphagnum moss, sphagnum mosses, sorry, be considered common in the moss family? Would they be considered? Would they be a large proportion of the species? Would they be a large proportion of the biomass? Um, well, species-wise, not a huge proportion of the species. I mean, I think there's about 30 sphagnum species in Ireland, and something like 350. Yeah. I think 350 is a number worldwide, maybe more than that, but not a, you know, not, you know, there's not thousands and thousands, but biomass wise, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you look at any bog, the amount of sphagnum, and if you consider that most of the peat in the bog is made of sphagnum as well, yes. Out of, yeah, so, yeah. so biomass wise, sphagnum are a huge contributor, yeah. And what do, what do mosses do for us, sorry? Um, apart from their beauty that you've obviously shown us today, someone's asking, what, what benefits do we gain from them? Well, you've I mean, I, well, I think that intrinsic value is the most important thing that I mean, that's, but what we gain, I mean, there's, I think there's, you know, plenty of studies looking at their usefulness. So people, you know, there's been studies looking at compounds you can get from them for, you know, for various maybe medicinal uses, I'm not sure. And, um, and uh, of course, sphagnum, but in the past has been very beneficial to, to well, in Ireland, especially because it, it's for most of the peat. So, I mean, it was a very important fuel source. Economically, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm, go on, sorry. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, the, the, there's it's maybe, the, there's probably lots of uses that they haven't really been investigated as well, that, you know, they're kind of not really on people's radars. So, so they haven't really been exploited maybe as much as, you know, these, as higher plants as such, because, you know, they're so kind of cryptic, as it were. Cryptic cryptograms, cryptograms, sorry. Um, I think we've covered a huge amount there, Rory. Uh, thanks so much. Really appreciate your time today. I uh, really appreciate the people's eyes have been opened very much so, I think, by this talk today. Um, so thank you very much for, for giving the afternoon to us. And, um, and and for the rest of you folks, I'm sure hopefully Rory will join us again for a talk. But um, thanks for everyone uh, to join joining us today at the National Botanic Gardens. Um, we'll have a talk again next week. Next week's talk is very timely because we'll be joined by Oshin Duffy of the National Biodiversity Data Centre. Oshin's going to introduce us to the National uh, Spring Flowering Plants Project, which is a nationwide citizen science survey where we can get out and about within our local area um, and record some of the spring's emerging blooms all around Ireland. And while you're doing so, you can also look at uh, the mosses and bryophytes. And again, don't take them, but you can uh, have a look at those and start maybe just to get the eye in and to appreciate them more and um, maybe hopefully to identify some of them. So uh, thanks for listening, folks. Thanks for viewing uh, Botanic Gardens out.